So it's really, it's a pleasure to be here. And I have to say, probably like most of you, I'm feeling like Jewish unity and Jewish peoplehood has to be the conversation of the hour. And Jewish unity and Jewish peoplehood cannot only be about mourning our losses. It has to be about creating, founding, initiating, qualifying, collaborating, arguing, doing something affirmative, building peoplehood, not having it thrust upon us from the outside. And it's for that reason that I want to dedicate this lecture to the people who found themselves this past week in Paris, whether Jewish, whether Muslim, whether Christian, whether something else, who found themselves in the line of fire, who put themselves in the line of fire, who fell, who ended up in hospital, and who ended up making it out alive. It's a difficult moment for the world. It's a difficult moment. With that all said, I want to, um, I guess I, I want to start with a taxonomy. I want to start with a classification. For anyone who's read Rabbi Danielle Hartman's uh, The Boundaries of Judaism, good job. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's a great book. He starts with a quick classification of three different ways in which communities can get along and deal with difference. And I want to start with these classifications because in a moment, we're going to dive in pretty deeply to some rabbinic text and rabbinic paradigms, but I want to set out ahead of time in plain English what we're talking about here. And his taxonomy is three parts. He says there's the pluralistic community in which all positions have equal merit. That's something that is not easy to, it's not easy to accomplish because what it means is what's good for me is good for me and what's good for you is equally good for you. Not easy to accomplish. Then there's tolerance. We disagree with each other. I find that your opinion is not equal to my opinion. This I might call my son's uh, way of arguing with me. Your opinion is not equal to my opinion, but I'll tolerate it. It works. It's practical. The third, and you can see in which direction we're moving, something which he calls deviance. What you do or what you think deviates is over the limit. It's beyond the limit. And what's fascinating is that once someone reaches deviation, you'd think that that means all deviation is created equal. But that's not true. We all know it. The deviation, the deviance that you joke about is legalized marijuana deviance. It's deviance, and I'm not talking about drug use right now. That's a metaphor. It's deviance that eh, everybody does it. We know. We joke about it. It's not such a big deal. But then there's real deviance, that's intolerable deviance, where, sorry, you pushed your limits. And once you've pushed your limits, says Danielle Hartman, there are a few ways the community can relate to you. They can deny your basic membership in their community. They can allow you to be a member but discredit you from ritual inclusion. They can involve you in ritual inclusion, but loyalty as in mutual care. When something happens to you, they're not there for you because the assumption is that you're not there for them in a real way. And then there's naming. They can label you completely other, completely outside. This is a very wide scale that we've just set out from pluralism all the way to naming someone as completely outside of the camp, okay? I want to play for the next 45 minutes with two models from rabbinic law, originating actually both in the biblical canon. I want to play with two models that 
I think, at first blush, seem at odds with each other. But in some sense, I believe in order for us to be a real people, must be used in tandem. I'm going to present the most extreme version of each of these models. First of all, in order to get you a little riled up, because that's one of the beautiful things we do at Hartman. We like to be a little bit challenging, a little bit provocative, to get people out of their sort of comfort zone so that we can think and talk and argue and actually have to justify our opinions as opposed to just taking them for granted and becoming bored by our own um, convictions. But also because I think the only way these two can work in tandem is if neither of them are taken to their most extreme. So I want you to see how impossible it is. I also wanna take each one to their extreme because I want you to see how each of these models plays out in our Jewish discourse in North America. And I'm actually going to take two cases, two contemporary cases, and show how people who are talking to one another about certain issues in the Jewish community writ large are often talking past one another because one is using one model and one is using the other. So with all of that preamble, let's make some moves. The univocal model. We're on page one, number one. Deuteronomy 17. Now, I'm a staunch believer in reading things in their original at the same time as I am a staunch believer in everybody being on the same page. So we're going to go back and forth between English and Hebrew. We're going to start with English, okay? If there arise a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, even matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall arise and go up to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And you shall come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and you shall inquire, and they shall declare unto you the sentence of judgment. In other words, we're going to have circuit courts, and those circuit courts are going to take their problems up the food chain if they have no answer, if they don't know what to do. What happens when it goes all the way up the food chain to Jerusalem, to the place that God shall choose, to Jerusalem, to the judges and the Levites there? Well, this is what happens in verse 10. And you shall do according to the tenor of the sentence, which they shall declare unto you from that place, which the Lord shall choose. And you shall observe to do according to all that they shall teach you. You have to listen. Who's the you? Just show of hands here. The you are the litigants, the people who have the dispute in the first place. They have to listen to what the Supreme Court says. Who's, who's with me on that? How about the courts, uh, the judges from the lower courts who came to check out? So they have to listen also. Parenthetically, what happens if those judges disagree with what the Supreme Court has said? Tough luck. It's more than tough luck. Take a look at number 11, verse 11, and I'm going to read this one in Hebrew because I want you to see certain words. Al pi haTorah asher yorucha, based on the teaching that they will teach you, vi al hamishpat asher yomru lecha, and the sentence that they will deliver, ta'aseh, you shall do. Lo tasur, do not deviate min hadavar from what they tell you, asher yagidu lecha, from that which they tell you, yamin, small, right or left. No deviation. No deviation. But someone who purposely does who does not listen to what the priest in that Supreme Court has said the one who is there to serve God or the judge what happens to that person who refuses to listen? Umeit ha'ish ha'hu, that person is dead man walking. Uvi'arta haram Yisrael. And you must cleanse Israel. 
of its evil. V'chol ha'am and all of the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. The way that the rabbis read this is that it's less about the litigants and more about judges themselves. And by the way, the way that the rabbis read this is not even that it's about the judges from the lower courts. Because of course the judges from the lower courts want to listen. They came to the Supreme Court in the first place. This, say the rabbis, is about the members of the Supreme Court themselves. The dissenting opinion. Whoever writes the dissenting opinion may not act upon their opinion if theirs is not the majority. Now, we've been envisioning this as a case between two litigants and say there's some monetary dispute. That's not the way the rabbis read this. The rabbis read this is if there is any sort of dispute, misunderstanding, not between litigants, but just trying to figure out even among leaders themselves how policy should be made in terms of Jewish practice. Once that Supreme Court has ruled, the dissenting opinion must listen, must follow, literally at the peril of their own life. They may not teach others to do what they say, they may not do what their opinion holds. They may not follow their conscience. They must listen. Wow. This is a model that does not tolerate a lot of deviance. This is a model that does not tolerate any difference. This is a model that is concerned primarily with setting policy with moving in a direction, with making a decision, with being practical. Anybody in the audience like this model? Be honest, does anybody in the audience like this model? Thank you, be honest, thank you. Okay, your honesty is a, is a virtue, right? Something that this model can afford. Things are very clear. Unless you're the person on the Supreme Court who disagrees, for the average Jew in the pew like you and me, this is very helpful. We know exactly what to do. The decision has been made, there's no competition, there it is. It's very simple. It's very black and white, who's in, who's out. Things don't get too complicated. It makes policy decisions that much easier. But there are some dangers to this model, as I think many people intuitively feel. The danger to this model is that even though there's debate within the Supreme Court itself, there is no debate in real life. There is no way to try out the different versions and see which one floats and see which one works. It's I like to call it Costco Judaism. Everybody gets, it's in bulk. Everybody has to do the same thing. The other thing that is problematic, and you're gonna see why I say it's problematic, even though I'm a firm believer in the rabbis and rabbinic law, is because dissenting views aren't always recorded. So, it, the American Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, the dissenting view is recorded. But we don't know what happens in that room that the rabbis are understanding to be the Jewish Supreme Court. So the dissenting view is lost. You can't teach it, you can't act on it. You might be able to teach it in some theoretical way, but you have to be very careful. And I'm talking from the rabbinic perspective, the way that they describe it in the tone. The other thing that's difficult about it is that it's very easy to fall into rhetoric. Everything is deviance, and so I can talk about it however I want. I can kick people out all the time for anything that isn't the mainstream. There's a danger here. There's a danger here. But I want you to see 
that what I think is actually the big greatest danger, and I think that the danger of rhetoric is great danger, what I think is the greatest danger is actually pretending that there's no debate to begin with. Take a look with me in number three. This is ostensibly, anyone here ever learned ethics of the fathers? I like to call it ethics of the ancestors because I think the women probably had some ethics too. That's my feeling, it's a gut. I'm gonna stick with it. So you read ethics of the ancestors, Pirkei Avot, you read it and it is so beautiful, so ethical, so pariv, neutral. There's no debate. There's no debate. The greatest debate is a conversation about what is the greatest way to live, this way or that way. That's pluralism. There's no saying, me, not you. There's me and you. But what's interesting is that the way that a vote begins is by papering over dispute. And the way that it continues is by papering over dispute. And ironically, probably in the realm of ethics, we'd have our greatest disputes today. Moses received the Torah from Sinai, number three, on page two. Moses received the Torah from Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua and Joshua to the elders and the elders to the prophets and the prophets transmitted it to the people of the great assembly. Simon the just was among the remnants of the people of the great assembly. Antigonus of Soho received from Simon the just. Yossi the son of Yoezer of Sereda and Joseph the son of Yochanan of Jerusalem received from him. Joshua the son of Parachia and Nittai the Arbalite received from them. Judah, son of Tobai, Simon, son of Shetach, received from them. Shemaiah and Aphtalion received from them. Hillel and Shammai received from them. So this was not broken telephone. This was telephone, right? Simon the Just said this. Antignos of Soho got it. Antignos of Soho gave it over to uh, um, Yossi, the son of Yoezer. Yossi, the son of Yoezer, gave it over to Yo. Absolutely perfect. No debate. We got it. We know exactly. And you know who started making all the trouble? It was Hillel and Shammai who ended up making all the trouble. And guess what? Avot doesn't move past them on purpose because we don't want to hear about the arguments in Avot. Avot, the purpose of it is not to hear about arguments. The purpose of it is to teach us how to live ethical lives, all things that we would agree upon, all above, almost super erogatory, right? Meaning above the line of what we would argue about, well, of, yeah, of course it's good not to be stingy. No one's going to argue that with you, right? But there are other ways in which we might argue about ethics, but that's not the direction in which a vote goes. So to my mind, we have two dangers and we have two advantages. I want to see how this plays out in real Jewish life. There are two very big issues on the table before what happened in France, and I think some of the rhetoric and conversation may change as a result, but I don't know. Two very big issues on the table. One, within the conservative movement, interdating, intermarriage, right now is the hot topic. It's the hot topic because USY, their youth group, has just uh, relaxed a rule that they had in their bylaws their board members were not supposed to be dating people outside of the Jewish faith. That set off a firestorm for people who have been following. The second issue is Israel. Israel has become an issue. Israel that we love and care about has become an issue. And the way in which we disagree about Israel well, let's see for ourselves. It's always difficult to quote someone who's young, as in a college student or that age, because you never want to point fingers at someone. And I'm not trying to point a finger. I'm really just trying to give us a sampling of how this low tasur, do not deviate model looks in the world. Because what it means at its, at its best, what it means is it's trying to delineate boundaries. 
Let's take a look. Jesse Arm, why I am now a former conservative Jew. Number four. My name is Jesse Arm. I am a grandson of a former conservative rabbi, a former student of a conservative Jewish day school, a former president of the Detroit chapter of USY, and a former conservative Jew. The last of those characteristics is the newest one attached to my identity. In fact, I made the decision to no longer classify myself in this fashion less than 24 hours ago upon reading of the recent change in the standards decided upon at USY's international convention. Formerly, to take on a leadership position in the USY youth movement, it was considered a requirement that board members commit themselves to refrain from relationships which can be construed as interdating. And might I just add a sensitive word for a moment? All of us in the crowd don't know each other. We probably have very different opinions on this issue. This is not a personal issue about anyone of us in this room. This is an example of how when we do disagree fundamentally about things, we should or should not talk about it, okay? Just to keep that in our sights. I never want to shy away about, uh, from talking about an issue. It's all about how the issue is presented. And I think that actually is a very important foundation in terms of disagreement, okay? The language was changed to the officers will strive to model healthy Jewish dating choices. These include recognizing the importance of dating within the Jewish community and treating each person with the recognition that they were created with Selim Elohim in the image of God. The change was made in an attempt to become a more inclusive youth group with a more inclusive movement. Perhaps the crux of this, of why this change so fundamentally irks me in, is in its lack of forthcoming language. If my former youth group, and in essence my former movement, is willing to compromise its commitment to the preservation of Jewish nationhood in the name of inclusivity, which is the way that he understands what this would mean, then why doesn't it just say so? It is clear that this movement is on a path of setting its commitment to its original cardinal principles aside in an effort to salvage some of its continually dwindling membership and changing with the times. No one ever said Judaism was supposed to be easy, no one ever said it was supposed to be all fun. Judaism is a faith that connotes certain principles and morals. At the core of those values is the preservation of the nation itself through committed relationships to one another, as well as to those principles which unite us all. Once the conservative movement abandoned adherence to this, that belief, it abandoned me as well. What's interesting is what happens in this piece is what Jesse says is he says there are certain things that for me are have taken me beyond my limits. And for him, he defines something as beyond his limits, okay? We're gonna see a different model that comes from within the conservative community that was also a response, but it uses the second model that we're gonna talk about for disagreement. So don't think we're gonna end here, okay? I just wanna give voice that this is essentially that model that has a point at which there's a limit. It will not tolerate everything, okay? It's only fair if I give you an example of this that's coming from the right, that I likewise give you an example of this that comes from the left. And what'll be fun to think about is, or maybe not so fun to think about, which one makes you more uncomfortable or less uncomfortable and why? Michael Walzer, along with a number of other um, renowned Jewish scholars, wrote a petition, an open petition, to the United States and the EU to censure certain Israeli politicians for their activities. Let's take a look at number five, scholars for Israel and Palestine, pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, pro-peace. The perspective contained in the following statement are the collective thinking of the, of the signatories as developed through discussions of the SIP. It does not represent the views of the SIP as a whole, the third narrative, that's where it was published, or any other institution. Israel, a time for personal sanctions. A central obstacle to a just peace between Israelis and Palestinians is the continuing occupation of the West Bank. Accordingly, we call on the United States and the European Union to impose personal sanctions on a cluster of Israeli political leaders and public figures who lead efforts to ensure permanent Israeli occupation of the West Bank and to annex all or parts of it unilaterally in violation of international law. We single out 
four powerful Israeli political leaders and public figures who promote these unjust, unlawful, and destructive policies in their most extreme and dangerous form. Now I need to reiterate, when I bring this as an example, everyone in this room has his or her own opinions on this issue. We probably disagree, all of us, very strongly in one way or another. This is not, to, this is not meant as a personal attack or advocacy for anyone's perspective. This is meant as an example of how discourse works in our community. Equal disclaimers. These four explicitly support policies of permanent occupation and unilateral annexation. They reject efforts to negotiate peace and actively sabotage U.S.-led efforts to promote them. They advocate and implement unilateral actions designed to preclude a negotiated peace. They are therefore legitimate targets for personal sanctions by the U.S. and the EU. Who are they? You know it would be a fun game. Making you guess. Naftali Bennett, the leader of the Jewish Home Party, and Minister of Economy, Religious Services, Jerusalem and Diaspora Affairs. Uri Ariel, a member of the Knesset from the Jewish Home Party and Minister of Construction and Housing. Moshe Faglin, a member of the Knesset from the Likud Party and Deputy Speaker of the Knesset. Faglin stands out for his straightforward and undisguised extremism. Zev Hever, also known as Zambish, um, Secretary General of Amana since 1989. Let's just get a show of hands. Who here was un uncomfortable with the first example of our low tassur discourse that I pointed out, if you're willing to admit it, okay? Uncomfortable as in, that's just, that's not the way that, you don't agree, let's go with that. Let's start with you don't agree. Who doesn't agree with point number one? Jesse Arms piece. Now, who was uncomfortable by what they read in number one? And this is why it's tricky, he's a college student, I'm not, let's just be careful, this is not a personal anything, okay? Number two, who here disagrees with move number two that we just read from the SIP? Who here is uncomfortable by the petition? Is there anyone here who is totally comfortable with both? Is there anyone here who was uncomfortable with both? Very nice. I really can't tell. It's, it's, it, that's good. I think that's a good thing. We're, we're being relatively consistent. That's the low tassur model. That's the don't deviate model. I presented it in as extreme a form as I can, okay? By the way, I could have presented it more extremely, but some of the stuff that's been written is just plain offensive, and I couldn't read it out loud. I just could, I read it in my office to my office made out loud, and we both almost fell off our chairs. So I wasn't going to try doing that again for my own sanity, let alone yours. But there's a turning point. This Lotasur model, this Lotasur model is actually a sovereign state model because it's a place where decisions need to get made, policies need to be turned into law, and people cannot just deviate from the law because if they do, it's going to be chaos. It's a state model. You might even say it's a Jewish commonwealth model. You might even say, by the way, that it's one of the reasons, or one of the reasons, why much of North American Jewry and the Israeli rabbinate do not get along is because they're working with totally different models, okay? They're working with totally different models. Let's move to the next model. There's a turning point. That turning point is when the state is lost, when the temple is destroyed, when the Jewish community for all intents and purposes, or I should say really its intellectual and spiritual leadership moves to the city of Yavne, things begin to change. Take a look at number six, an explanation of that verse that we had seen. You cannot deviate, you must do what that Supreme Court says. It says in number six, and you shall do according to the word regarding a ruling of the great court in Jerusalem, people can be put to death, but not regarding a ruling of the Beit Din at Yavne. The absolute policy-making power is now lost. 
and a new model is about to take its place. And that new model is described at the beginning of the Tosefta, for people who have heard of Mishnah, probably anthologized around the beginning of the third century. The Tosefta, we're not sure it's a little earlier, a little later. It's anthologized later, but it has material in it from earlier, okay? It's contemporaneous. The Tosefta described what happened when the rabbis got to Yavne. What was the process? Let's take a look at number seven. When the sages came together in the vineyard at Yavne, they said, the time will come when a person will seek a word of the words of Torah and will not find it. From the words of the scribes and will not find it. As it says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will send famine into the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. And they will wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They will run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and they will not find it. They said, let us begin from Hillel and from Shammai. Wait, let us begin from Hillel and from Shammai? We saw in Avot, Ethics of the Ancestors, that there was a lot before Hillel and Shammai. After the temple was destroyed, they said, does anybody know anything that Hillel and Shammai said? Wait, so are they saying there was like a rupture <laughs> and they lost everything earlier? And they say, okay, anybody know anything from Hillel and Shammai? Let's try to put this thing back together. Let's try to piece this back together. That's what they try to do. The whole tractate called Eduyot, it means testimonies. Essentially, people stand online and they say, oh, I remember what my teacher taught me about that. I remember what my teacher taught me about that. You remember it that way, I remember it that way. But you remember it that way, that rem We all probably know this story. A synagogue doesn't remember what their custom is about a certain issue. And so they're arguing this group says this, this group that says that. We have to go to the oldest member of our synagogue. Unfortunately, the man is dying. He's on his deathbed. They go to him and they say, Reb Moshe, you remember? This is the way we did it, right? And the other side says, this is the way we did it, right? And he says, you know, that does sound familiar. I think our custom was to argue about it. <laughs> it's not my joke. I can't take credit for it. But the point is, the point is, the rupture and the dislocation force them into a different model. They still want to stay unified and they're still going to need to make some policy decisions, but A, they don't have the pressure of making a policy decision that has to turn into law for everyone. And B, they don't have the mechanism by which to keep everyone in, by which to keep people following what they have to say. So they have to figure out how they're going to navigate this new terrain. And for the very first time, says Shia Cohen, and you know, I, we don't need to read it. I can tell you what he says, and you can read it on your own. For the very first time, a document like the Mishnah arises where you have more than one opinion recorded. The dissenting opinions are recorded. And not only are the dissenting opinions recorded, but some follow one and some follow the other. There is no unified policy necessarily. But it's not so easy to figure out what's gonna keep us together then. What's gonna keep this group together if there's no one pushing them in a particular direction? So you need to use people's internal motivations. Here's an internal motivator, number nine. Deuteronomy 14, records a ruling about people in mourning. People in mourning may not scratch themselves, literally cut themselves, which seemed to have been a practice in the ancient Near East among idolatrous peoples, and they're not allowed to tear their hair out, which also seemed to be such a practice. The Hebrew for not cutting oneself is lo tit go de do. Do not cut. Lo tit go de do. The way that the rabbis read this is not as do not cut. Number 10 explains lo tit go de do. Do not cut yourselves. Play on words. Lo teasu agudot. Do not become factions. Agudot from tit go de do. Do not become factions. Ella, rather, heyu kulchem aguda achat. 
All of you should be one group, one aguda. Wait a minute, wait a minute, but we all have different opinions. How, and you have no mechanism by which to keep us in. Well, that is the mechanism by which to keep us in. If you buy into the unity paradigm, you don't want to become fractious, so you'll stay together. And you'll all try to follow the same, no. So they try. The Talmud Yerushalmi, the Palestinian Talmud, which is finished, um, closed about the end of the fourth century of the Common Era. The Talmud Yerushalmi tells a story that literally there was a point at which they felt that everybody had to even have the same customs. I like to call this, everybody has to have the same color tablecloth. Drive the same station wagon, which as a young parent, I'm starting to feel like it's kind of true. The Mishnah says, and this is the top of page six, in places where people are accustomed to working until midday on the eve of Passover, certainly not something, I mean, that any of us might be working on the eve of midday Passover, right? The, the eve before Passover begins. Right? We're working to the minute if we're talking about preparing Passover or booking the tickets, obviously, and getting on that flight. But this is a custom that some groups did not busy themselves on the eve of Passover so that they have strength for the evening. They prepare so that they could sit around at the Seder and talk, fight, and do all the good things we do at the Seder, right? Rabbi Shimon, the son of Lakish, in the Gemara section there, the Talmudic commentary upon that Mishnah, asked Rabbi Yochanan, is it not forbidden out of concerns of Lotit Godudu? How could you have a place where some people work on the eve of Passover and some people don't? Don't we all have to have the exact same customs? And the conversation continues, well, in this case, it's okay. Clearly, what's happening here is this is the Lotasur model of don't deviate. There's a, an attempt to maintain it. Of, well, we even have to have the same custom. It's not going to fly. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be possible. So when you get to the Babylonian Talmud, which is codified about a century and a quarter later, you find something different. Number 12. Abaye said, when we say lo go to do, do not become fractious. Well, what's a fractious situation? We refer to a situation such as having two courts in one city, one which rules like the house of Shammai and the other like the house of Hillel. But two courts in two different cities, not problematic. Okay, still a little centralized probably for our taste. Each city can have its own court and rule its own way. But within a city, one court still. Otherwise, it's too fractious. Put a lot of synagogues out of business. Rava said to him, what do you mean you can't have two courts in one city? That's not true. But were not the houses of Shammai and Hillel who might have been friends, as Rabbi Fruithandler told us today, themselves similar to having two courts in one city. They didn't agree. Not only didn't they agree, they didn't follow one another's rulings. And their followers didn't follow one another's rulings. And they were in the same city. Rather, Rava said, when we say lo tit go to do, do not become fractious, we refer to a situation such as having one court in a city. You have one court, but what's the problem? What's fractious about it? Where half the decisors rule like the house of Shammai and half rule like the house of Hillel. But having two courts which rule differently in a single city is not problematic. We just need to be able to have the infrastructure for both. Taken to its logical conclusion, anything is possible any opinion has, there's room for any opinion so long as infrastructure can be built around that opinion and it won't destroy the infrastructure that already exists. And I have to say, the reason I started thinking about this in the first place is last year when the Conference of Presidents voted not to allow J Street to be a part of the conference, I was really thinking to myself, is it possible for a group like the Conference of Presidents to have J Street as part of their group and still be able to make policy the way they had wanted to? Or would that be too fractious, like having one court 
half of which rule one way, half of which rule another? Or is it more of an umbrella group that is simply, well, that's okay. Each one of us represents our own city, our own infrastructure, and we just come together on occasion to talk and see each other and advocate in certain ways. And I really started thinking about what, aside from symbolism, I'm not talking about symbolism. I'm talking about practical policy. How do we get things done? What you can see here is that what Lotit Go to do tries to do, don't fracture, become fractious, don't fracture yourselves essentially. What it tries to do is it tries to maintain unity, but the way it maintains unity is it says, you know what, sometimes we each have to go our own way. That's the way to maintain unity. You can have your place and you can have your place and you can have your place and I can have my place. And we don't have to disrupt each other. We don't have to disrupt each other. I want to go back to our two issues that I brought up before, and I want to see two examples of responses that follow this low to go to do model uh, more. But first I want to talk about the pros and cons of this model. Who likes this model? Who dislikes this model? Be honest, we got one, one person who dislikes this model, two people who dislike this model. What I think is positive about this model, healthy debate. Not just healthy debate in the confines of a, of a conference room, healthy debate in how things actually work out in real life. How does this play out? Try it, is this gonna work? Experiment with it, let's see. That's very different, it's much more open. Also, less rhetoric, just less rhetoric. If there's room for each person to have their own, there's less rhetoric. You don't have to other people. There's room for more people. All the people who would have found themselves outside of the camp, you now have a mini camp for everybody. Everybody's got their mini camp. The cons. What if we start looking so different from each other that we don't recognize each other? And we're not talking about the people who disagree, we're talking about the children of the people who disagree. And the grandchildren of the people who disagree and they move so far from each other. And where's the unity? What happened to Lotit go to do? Don't become fractious. Moreover, what are the parameters? One second, you're telling me that there are no red lines at all in Judaism? There are no red lines at all? How can you define yourself if you are not allowed to define any outer limits? Pros and cons. Let's look at some responses. Number 13. Rabbi Wesley Garden Schwartz backs off controversial plan for intermarriages. Wesley Garden Schwartz brings a delegation to the um, Hartman Summer Program, Community Learning Program, a huge delegation from his synagogue every year. Um, he's a big supporter of Hartman, and we're a big supporter of his. Within days of floating a proposal that would have allowed conservative rabbis to perform interfaith marriages, Rabbi Wesley Garden Schwartz of Temple Emanuel in Newton, Massachusetts, backed away from the controversial plan. In a recent email, Garden Schwartz asked congregants to consider a proposal for a new shul policy that would enable him to officiate at interfaith weddings in cases where the couple commits to a covenant to raise Jewish children. The shift would have made him the first prominent conservative clergyman to break with the movement's iron ironclad rule against rabbis performing intermarriages. Conservative clergy cannot officiate or at or attend an interfaith wedding, Garden Schwartz wrote. But I am worrying whether that response has grown stale and whether a new response would better serve the needs of our families and of our congregation. But just days after Garden Schwartz floated the idea, he abruptly backed down from its most controversial element, that he be permitted to perform interfaith weddings. The covenant to raise Jewish children will not work, Garden Schwartz said in a subsequent email sent to congregants this week and shared with JTA. In my initial proposal, I had written that I would perform an intermarriage if the interfaith couple would, by signing a written covenant, affirm that if God blessed them with children, they would raise their children exclusively as Jews. This idea received many negative reviews, especially from our interfaith families whom we were trying to reach by it. According to Garden Schwartz, who has been at Temple Emanuel since 1997, Congregants said such a covenant would be asking too much too soon. They also said it did not account for those unable to have children or past childbearing age, would be unfair to require only of interfaith couples, and would be unenforceable and therefore a mere formality. 
These objections persuaded me that the covenant is not workable, Garden Schwartz wrote. What's interesting, and I also want to clarify when we say that we're Rabbi Garden Schwartz supporter, that has nothing to do with a Hartman position on this issue. That has everything to do with Rabbi Garden Schwartz as a leader of the Jewish people, as a wonderful human being, and as a very dedicated teacher and learner of Torah, and Hartman Torah specifically. This is a very different approach. At bottom, he's still taking a stance. But his stance is, well, let's try to build an infrastructure around it that works. It's very different. It's much more of a low to go to do. It's much more of a let's not become fractious. Let's not let this fracture us. Let's figure out how to make this work. Back to our Israel issue. Yehuda Kurtzer. Number 14, fighting for Israel, not against it. It's always a good idea to end off a talk by quoting your boss. <laughs> fighting for Israel, not against it. I don't usually do those cheap jokes, but that's a really, that's a good one. And Yehuda, I hope you enjoy this when you watch it. <laughs> fighting for Israel, not against it. At least I didn't wink. When did we all agree to substitute coercion for persuasion? Number 14, what is happening to the increasingly lost art of firmly, passionately arguing our positions to say with respect and conviction to another person, this is why you are wrong. The most recent and in many respects most surprising offenders in this elision were the members of a group of Zionist professors, educators, and journalists who issued a statement calling for sanctions against four Israeli political figures. I understand and relate to the impulses that led to this action. I too am frustrated as an American Jew, as someone with deep ties to friends, colleagues, and institutions in Israel, and as a Jew who believes that the state of Israel is an essential and inextricable feature of Jewish identity, to see that there is seemingly little I can do from far away to work in fighting trends such as the deepening social inequalities brought about by years of security fears, terror, and occupation. The actual constructive choices at my disposal, such as moving to Israel to vote, giving on a small scale to NGOs, working on progressive issues, and teaching as part of my work about inspired engagement with Israel are fundamentally limited. And combined with the prevailing anxiety in the Jewish communal establishment about the limits of legitimate American Jewish interference with Israeli policies, this frustration feels more like impotence. I see in this august roster of scholars, wise teachers, and colleagues, a network of longtime Zionists who I admire for their legacy, support, legacy of support for Israel and I respect their belief in their own courage and capacity to affect change. And yet, I believe these actions and this decision to try to punish rather than persuade signal a deep failure of imagination and negate the very values these scholars have worked hard to uphold. Michael Walzer, one of the signatories and a longtime colleague at the Shalom Hartman Institute, has written about the fundamentally intertwined nature of pluralism and democracy as characteristics of the American idea. In his argument against fundamentalism, Walzer suggests that in a thriving democracy, policy emerges from freewheeling debate and open debate on ideas. Implicit in Walzer's argument is the corollary as it comes to the outcomes of such debates, namely that losing an argument is still an act of participating in a democracy. Basically, what I wanna do is I wanna come here and I wanna challenge all of us. I wanna challenge those of us, no, let's do it differently. I wanna challenge all of us. I wanna challenge all of us in the following way. I think there is place for both of these paradigms in Jewish life, and I think that each of these paradigms is essential at different moments to different communities in different ways. I think that to say there are no limits to what Judaism is, is to make Judaism completely porous, and it's to lose the definition. Where you draw those lines and where you draw those limits, that's gonna differ markedly among all of us and our communities, and that's going to be some, some heart-wrenching debate within communities. But I think to throw the model out altogether is a grave mistake. At the same time, I think for those of us who are drawn to that model of drawing boundaries, we probably could challenge ourselves on two fronts. One, we probably could challenge ourselves to look at the low to go to do model and to try to figure out how is it that we can embrace others who differ from us and figure out a way, maybe the boundaries, maybe I set my limits a little too close to myself. Maybe I can expand them a little. Maybe I can push them out a little. 
And if that's not possible, because you really, you, we, all of us, introspect, and we really believe that the limits that we see are the limits, maybe I can make sure that that low tasur, that deviance, does not become an excuse for rhetoric, does not become an excuse for ousting people. A healthy dose of both of these models in tandem with each other can keep either model from running away with itself too far. And while the Lotasur model seemed to be a state model and the Lotit Godudu model seems to be a diasporic model because you don't have a way to enforce nor do you have the stress of trying to make the policy decisions all together, I think that it is necessary to consult with both models no matter where you are. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Don't be shy. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Did you hear the question? No. Try it again. Try it again. I listened to you, and the essence of what you're saying is to encourage disagreement, encourage dialogue, confrontation, challenge. What does one do when the other person or a group of people don't want to listen, don't want to take it in, don't want to hear, don't want to digest it? How do you handle that? Good question. I think. Um, I think that it's very important, first, no, first of all, personal conversations with people I think are very important as opposed to um, big groups of people getting together and discussing things. If there are two sides of an issue that different people represent, let those people talk to each other face to face and have a conversation and see where that goes. The second thing is everybody in the conversation has to be okay with agreeing to disagree. So if I bring an opinion to someone and they say, I'm sorry, that's anathema to me. I have to be okay with saying, okay, that's anathema to you. It's not to me. To me, it's a blessing. To you, it's anathema. I need to be okay with that. And I need to realize that that's not a person attacking me personally. At the same time, there need to be ground rules that that person can't attack me personally. We need to set ground rules for our debate that no matter whether you're using a low tassur model or whether you're using a low tit go to do model, personal attacks are not an option. Making people the butt of a joke, not an option. Mocking people's lifestyles, not an option. Not an option. This is very serious. This is Jewish peoplehood. This is our future. Good question, Michelle, thank you. Anybody else? Over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. I'll, I can repeat his question. It's okay. Uh, so the problem that, that seems to me is uh, you need two parties who want to have a discussion. Some parties want no part of discussion, and and so. There's, there's, there's no place to go. I am a naive optimist and staunch realist at the same time. I always want to leave that door open. I always, always, always want to leave that door open. Now, you have to understand that for eight years, I served as a female clergy member in the Orthodox community. Okay? That was a very wonderful experience. There are some people for whom, no matter how sensitive I could be in my role, my very existence was not a good idea from their perspective. They didn't want to talk to me about it. 
but they also didn't want to write about me and they didn't want to badmouth me. And to be honest, that was enough for me. And I think sometimes that has to be enough because you have to remember also, there are some groups of we the North American Jews who have a different standard of what dialogue looks like or means and don't put a value in it in the same kind of way. So maybe you're introducing another model which is sometimes silence is okay as long as it is really silence as opposed to snickering behind closed doors. I hope that's helpful. I hope that's helpful. Uh, yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hi, I'm Rabbi Dean Zager. I'm a rabbi uh, from a knee in West Hollywood and a Pleasure. department in the University of Bay. I look forward to seeing, are you going to be on RTS this summer? Yes. Looking forward. Um, I, I, I want to be a little provocative. Good. Good. Works very well from a rabbinic perspective of uh, a communic discourse of univocal versus multivocal. Uh -huh. um, I said it looks very nice and in a nice package to have a univocal but of multivocal packages. But let's be honest. And especially, let's get really real for a minute. Um, there are times when to disagree within the Jewish community. Um, isn't all such a nice package or we're, not, or we're talking past each other. Um, and when there is a, a real issue, uh, how do you, how, what is your analysis of how to do that and move when we're moving from deviance to make the deviance mainstream? How do we move to be the most inclusive and welcoming of faith traditions and what should be then the process for doing that? Can I ask you what model you're thinking about first? Well, let's, you just gave us your model. You were a, but I want, I want you were a clergy person yes. in, a, in an Orthodox community mm -hmm. uh, before the Maharats were ordained. You got it. And before a number of our uh, Orthodox women colleagues were ordained uh, and had smicha. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's not, I would hardly say it's mainstream. You did it at a time when it was still deviant. I did it in a way that was I understand, but not you did it, very but, deviant. Yes. Well, let's. Let, I want to be. I want to be careful to use Daniil's I know, understanding I'm of deviance. I'm not. Not. I'm. I want to be very careful in how we use his words. Yes. So, in an era when many people, even within the Orthodox world, let alone my Reform world. Yeah. would say where women rabbis are accepted and are leaders and are leaders of large pulpits and large organizations, um, as how do you move from the soft and gentle voice to what I'll call a commanding voice uh, and moving again from the deviance to the normative as part of that process? Okay, so I actually think that the low tit go to do model of having different, um, different groups, different communities doing different things is actually a very good model for that. I do not think that what I did in my uh, tenure as an Orthodox clergywoman has to become uh, mainstream for all Orthodox synagogues. I do not think so. I think that each synagogue and each local group has to make their own decisions and figure out where they are and where they need to go. Now, I can choose to be part of those communities or choose not to be, and they can choose to be part of my community or choose not to be, and I think that's perfectly okay. I really think that's perfectly okay because I don't think that we're all going to agree, agree and so long as it's a values conversation and it's not misogyny, I'm okay with it. And I think that might be a difference in terms of the way we're thinking about this from what I can tell. I don't think that necessarily my position has to become the position. I just know that my position needs its own place and needs its own space. And if I can find space for that and I can make space around it, I think that's great. I think that works. I hope that's helpful in, in responding. Um, I, yeah, we're going. Sir, your name? Philip Sinovsky. Philip, pleasure. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, the thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. 
I knew something special was going to happen there when you stood up. Um, that, thank you. You can draw the circle and bring people in. You can draw the circle in order to keep people out. I get that. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me so long as everyone has a circle. As long as everyone has a circle. We don't have to be in the same circle, in my opinion, so long as everyone has a circle. I hope that responds. Uh, the woman in purple is. And your name, ma'am? I'm Gail Leibovitz. Uh, I'm. Theo, uh, you said? Gail. Gail. Um, I am an ordained conservative rabbi. I teach at the American Jewish University. So I come out of the conservative tradition very, very much. Um, and one of the, I think, very, very important principles is, and I want to actually sort of piggyback on Denise's question, um, one of the deep, deep principles of our movement is what we call pluralism. And I think it's, I, I think that Danielle's got a lot to say to us about that. Yeah. Um, this is something I have struggled with, I think, my entire kind of adult life in the movement, and even as a leader yeah. in the movement, which is, um, so we consider ourselves a halakhic movement. Um, we advocate keeping kosher, keeping Shabbat, right? Um, so it's one thing when I eat only hexer cheeses and you eat unhexer cheeses because Isaac Klein, whatever number of years ago, said that was OK. And it's one thing if I don't turn on the lights in my house and you do turn on the lights in your house because we have different understandings of electricity and whether it's a violation of Shabbat or not. The problem comes, I think, precisely in the place that you're talking about and that Denise is talking about, which is when we start to challenge who's in, who's out, um, and how do I accept as a leader in my movement that my movement says I can be a rabbi, but not all of my male colleagues have to accept that. How do I tolerate, how do I accept your right not to accept me. How do I tolerate your right to discriminate against me? That's I, the tricky I, place. That is the tricky apart. place. That is the tricky place, and thank you for naming the tricky place. I have to be honest, twofold. Number one, I think that the onus is on both parties to prove that this is a values argument that they're having and not simple prejudice or bias, but a values argument. If something can be put as a values argument, then you're already speaking on a different plane where no one is looking at each other as a non-person or a non-entity. If it is not a values argument, then you're right. It's not an argument at all. It's, it's simple cruelty, actually. Personal. The second thing is that I really think that part of this ensuring that everyone's having a values argument is that the onus is on me as someone who disagrees with someone to be civil and appropriate and respectful. The onus is on the person with whom I disagree to be able to be comfortable in his or her own skin that there's a disagreement. We live in a movement-based Judaism that's changing rapidly. And that makes things difficult. Because within my movement, within your movement, within the reform movement, within the reconstructionist movement, among renewal rabbis, you're going to find different customs and perspectives and convictions. And it's going to impact the way people feel. That's some of the liability of trying to live together in movements. I think that's part of the reason why movements are starting to fizzle a little bit in one way or another. And I'm not saying that as the downfall of any particular movement. I'm saying I think that people are trying to engage less particularly as a denomination and more as Jews who have certain convictions about certain things. And I think part of it is because anytime you have something institutionalized, it means that by definition, somebody has to roll with some punches that they're not comfortable with. It's, that's the sensitivity. And it doesn't always work, but I do want to challenge us when we disagree that it must be based on some cogent argument and it must be done respectfully. And when we are disagreed with in the proper way that we are able to say, okay, agree to disagree. 
but I know we respect each other. That's, that's the, the sticky wicket. The, do, does the other person respect me? That's where it gets bad. If someone doesn't respect me, wait a second, peoplehood. You can't talk about peoplehood where somebody doesn't respect you, right? It's a basic core respect issue. And we need to try to cultivate that respect with everyone. And by the way, that's right and left. That's right and left of each of us. We need to try to model that respect and let other people learn from it. And it's not easy, by the way, because when I'm walking through a very right-wing, ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, I notice things that might make me feel like I need to defend my way of life, so I have to say certain things. When I'm walking through a reform neighborhood and I feel like I'm different and they look at me and I'm different, Right? These are all things, and I'm not talking about me. This is the way that we function. We're human beings. We're self-conscious. We're threatened. We're offended. But we need to work towards that mutual respect, even with whom we people with whom we disagree profoundly. It does not mean you need to spend time with those people. But it means you need to... You think? No, you don't have to have Thanksgiving dinner. But it means that those people are still your fellow Jews. You're still your fellow Jews, and you're still their fellow Jew. And that's really important to me. We have a lot of hands. Do we have a lot of time to match those lot of hands? Good. Nobody has a watch. Throw out your watches. It's fine. We oh, good. So we have 10 minutes. That's two and a half minutes per question. That woman's been raising her hand for a while. I'm sorry, Jamie, that you're running around. Um, I really appreciate it. I need it's my like 10,000 steps for the day. Right. Oh, very nice. This is like a Price is Right model. I think I have another one here. Uh, yes. I'm going to, uh, my name is Therese. Uh, Therese. I'm going to deviate, I'm going to deviate from agreeing to disagree and go to the major obstacle to peace is put completely on the shoulders of the state of Israel and and it is required to stop the occupation on the West Bank. That's what the that's American what, government thinks, and that's, that's what, what said. Uh, some uh, Jewish institutions think. Right. That is what some think. That is not the major obstacle. The Arabs don't want any Jews in Israel, not just in the West, in the West Bank. We have given the land back, we have done this, we have done that. And the thing is, they just don't want us occupying Therese, anything within that. Here's what, I, here's what I want to say. I want to say two things to that. Number one, I think this is a great example of people being agreeing to disagree. Whatever you saw on this paper, right, you disagree with it vehemently. This is a position, not only do you disagree with it, you think it's totally wrong and off and threatening to the Jewish people. Wait, one second, one second, one second, sorry. I think that that's great and totally fine. I don't think, I just want to make sure that people realize this was not about advocating any of this, these positions. This was only about showing how the discourse works in our Jewish community. Censure versus debate. That was the example where um, the, the professors who had written that petition, that was more of a low tassur model where they were basically saying, oh, Naftali Bennett's out. And what Yehuda Kurtzer was pushing for is, wait, what, you, you can't just push people out. You can't just censure people. Have debate, have conversations, support the, it, it, support the um, MKs who you agree with, right? That's all. It was just an example of discourse. It was not to advance any particular perspective and I, I think it's important that vehement debate, we would never try to shut down vehement debate. It's just that particular, there was no taking a stance. So I'm gonna leave that question alone, okay? Okay, we had, I think, a few more hands. Oh, some hands dropped. Oh my gosh, what happens? We have here and here, Dalit raised her hand, so maybe we'll go to Dalit next. Oh, he had his hand also. Okay, so after this gentleman. I'm Steve Stone. Steve Stone. The question is, how do you, how, 
how can you be rational with irrational people? <laughs> you have, and this is, this is the question, when people are rational and moral, they are usually able to talk to each other. But when people behave irrationally, Jews against Jews included, how, do you, how are you able to have anything work on that level? Let's do our best to try to inject more rationality into the Jewish discourse. Steve, you're right. We can't change human nature. We can't. All we can do is do our best. And by the way, there are some people, there's irrational and there's irrational. Honestly, and you know this and I know this. There are some people with whom you speak who really won't speak to you at all. There are some people who are just not used to speaking to you. There are some people who just are afraid to have the conversation. There are some people who don't even know you exist. Those are different versions of irrationality, okay? And that's an important distinction to make. Not everyone who doesn't have my idea of what discourse looks like is by definition that ultimate definition, that, that extreme version of irrational. And I think that helps because it brings a lot more people into that circle of discourse. Okay, we have this, this fellow in the back and then Dalit. Basically all issues, but, but what about the people that are saying, we're here to change the world and uh, on this particular issue, and we can have our passionate debates on those minor issues, but we're here to change the world we're so certain that our positions are right that we're really sorry, but you know what? Some people have to get pushed aside, and if we look at all the examples over the years of, of situations where you know, the world needed to be changed, whether it did or didn't, um, that's what you have to do. Is sometimes you just have to run people over. How do you run people over? Um, mockery, uh, 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 ridicule, uh, uh, saying that, uh, that if they come out of Israel, that they'll be arrested in Europe or America, all kinds of interesting ways that basically the foundation is, is we're right and you're wrong, and this idea of having a lovely debate, which is pleasant, but not on these issues, because these issues, you're just so wrong that we need to really either bend you to our will, or we just need to push you aside and get rid of you. So how do you deal with the people that will make that argument? Um, and how do, you, how do you pull them into saying, you know what, everything is really a debate, and ultimately the idea is, is that the appropriate position will at some point rise to the top? If you want to talk politics, and I don't mean Israeli politics or American politics, the, the smart political way to do that is to find someone who's in between the two of you and to see if they can serve as some sort of bridge to have some sort of conversation. And we have actually found that um, at Hartman to be something that's very useful in talking to people who we thought never would want to talk to us. But finding someone who's somewhere in between who touches both sides of the debate, sometimes a mediator, the mediating role, that works. Sometimes that really works. And again, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree but it does mean that people are gonna stop treading on each other's heads. But sometimes you have to, his question was, what do you do about people who wanna change the world? And they basically say, sorry, we have to tread on you in order to make that happen. We have to bend you to our will in order to make that happen. And my suggestion was a mediator, somebody who's somewhere in between their position and your position and being able to see if you can get to a table together to discuss. But without that mediated position, you're just talking past each other and you just look at each other as other. And, and to me, at the end of the day, this is all about conversations. It's all about conversations. Delete. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna going gonna to come around. Do not worry. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, when I look at the title of the program, it's called Peoplehood and Controversy, How Jews Should Disagree. And mm -hmm. my question is, um, when talking to a population that probably identifies largely as North American Jews, as American Jews, um, whether or not anything within the model is particular to this type of a community, as opposed to uh, Jews in Israel or elsewhere, 
Um, and within that question, whether or not there's a difference in how we disagree when talking among ourselves here as American Jews versus when we're talking about issues that might be part of you know, our Jewish identity, but as hyphenated Americans, you know, what the implications are for the themes that you're laying out. And then the second question I had, which may be related to the first, is when we're not actually involved in um, debate within the models that you're presenting, what do you recommend and how should people facilitate the emotions that they may feel when maybe they even know that they're not ready to debate, but yet they're feeling something and that something might relate to the fact that um, they're passionate, that they're feeling concerned. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm gonna go to number two, and then I'm gonna go back to number one. I think that not everything has to be about uh, debate all the time. Sometimes it could just be about acting. If there's something that I'm passionate about, go for it and do it and work on its behalf. Why does it always have to be me standing in the public sphere trying to justify it? Just be that fact on the ground. I really strongly believe in that. Your question about Israel is also a great question because if we were to ask ourselves whether we could stomach as much debate as we do, if we were responsible for setting policy for a country, the conversation might look a little different. The conversation might look a little different and that's a challenging thing to think about. If we were in a state, if we, had to, we didn't have the option of each Beit Din, each court in its city, but we were all one city, as it were, and needed to make it work, how could we possibly make it work? Now, I'm talking about lo tasur, don't deviate as setting outer limits. The conversation when you have to set policy together is not about setting outer limits, it's about setting a path forward, which is a much more constructive and constructed endeavor and requires a lot more decision making and a lot less room for deviation. And I think that's a very important distinction for us to think about. That doesn't mean shut down debate but it does mean it deserves a little bit of thought. The difference between the communities, it deserves a little bit of thought. Sir, your name? Bob Auerbach. Nice to meet you. You're first. Uh, Bob Auerbach. Um, in your second approach, it sounds like there is no room for any absolutes. Are there absolutes that uh, are a starting point for debate, or are there no absolutes and everything's relativistic? If you were to take the second view to its extreme, there would be no absolutes. Right. I believe that using the second view without mediating it through the low tasur view of don't deviate, not having any limits, not having any boundaries, I believe that that is deeply um, threatening to being able to continue to define Judaism as something. Hmm. I'm just being honest. But everybody's gonna draw that line in a different place, and I respect that. Last question. Last question. We have someone in the back oh, over there. I was gonna, hey. Your name? Michael Tolwin. Michael. And um, there's a few issues. Number one, uh, there's the concept of Elu Elu in Judaism. Which, These and those are the words of the living God. Right. So we can have difference of opinion, and yet we, they're all from Hashem. And nowadays, also, when Los Asuru seem, oh, I'm sorry, Los, Los Asuru, I'm wondering, from an historical perspective, maybe starting out as a people, we needed strong laws and regulations. And now we're in so many thousands of years later, uh, living in America, and religion, way of life is freedom. Everyone has a perspective of how best they want to live their life. And we're dealing with a perspective that 
we really, every one of us, are connected to God, and we're in the image of God. There's no particular priest class that we have, and so therefore we can connect to God in what we feel strongly about, justified about, as long as it doesn't hurt other people, is in, in a sense godly, if we're in touch with our spiritual sense. So therefore there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what we want. Everyone has their own perspective. Everyone, as you mentioned, can have their own circle, uh, which is the best way, we a certain comfort circle, and yet being able to relate to anyone else who takes the perspective of Elu Velu, being able to accept another opinion. Uh, so I'd like you to address that. I, I agree with most everything that you just said. Where I would say, I, I would add, is I would say, I do think that the line needs to be drawn somewhere. Because I think that when you try to define a people, being Irish has to mean something. Being Jewish has to mean something that's outside of our individual selves in some way. That's my conviction. I understand that you disagree. And I respect that. I'm serious. I don't, I, I'm serious. I'm serious. I thank you all very much and I hope that this is good food for thought. Have a wonderful night and thank you very much to Leo Beck for hosting us.